Hello and welcome to Outlaw Bookseller with me, Steve Lee Andrews, writer, bookseller, collector. And today we're going to do a top 10. We're going to look at some of the major names in SF in the 1980s. We're going to look at Americans and we're looking at male writers specifically. There will be at least one other video like this on the most important American SF writers of the 80s. There will also be another one about female ones. They'll come in the future because it was really hard to pick 10. And this isn't going to be a ranked list. I decided today to focus on 10 writers, they may be in 11th, they usually is, who, you know, had a big commercial and critical impact. There were people who I'd like to have mentioned, who I'm not going to mention in this video, such as K.W. Jeter and George Alec Effinger, because despite critical acclaim, I don't think they broke through in the same way. These are the people who I recall having, you know, big literary kudos, also big sales in the 1980s, both sides of the pond. And obviously that's when I went into book selling and we're going to talk about that and look at some of the sort of key books. If you want to get up to speed on 80s American SF on the male side and the cutting edge as it was then, this is like where you need to look. So we'll start without any further ado. It's easy to look back at the 80s now and characterize them in the sort of narrative of that time which came up in American SF and it was a really great time for American SF. British SF was seeming rather timid. A lot of writers weren't really sort of expanding this sort of readership and getting any bigger commercially. People like Guy Kill with Christopher Priest, great writers, but not sort of really seemed to grow their sales. And they were moving towards the mainstream and trying different things. And American SF seemed suddenly invigorated. The 70s was a strange time in SF. It was a great time and lots of fantastic books. And of course, decades bleed into each other. You know, the 60s bled into the 70s and the 80s in some ways didn't really get going to the 83, 84, you know, and there's that all that sort of hangover of the previous decade and it is an arbitrary thing, of course. But somebody who come in in a big way towards the end of the 80s, he'd been around since the early 80s, and he characterized the narrative that we saw then, which was the cyberpunks versus the humanists. And it was rather overstated, but there was something in it. And this was at the cyberpunk end, is Walter John Williams. And these are the first two books in the Hardwired sequence, Hardwired there, which I think came out, let's have a think, that would have been 86, and I remember buying a paperback with the same livery at the Worldcon 87, and it was published later in the UK, and it was followed by Voice of the Whirlwind, which was 87 a year later, and the relationship between them is very tangential. But Williams started his career in the early 80s. He wrote I think it was like a bit of naval fiction. Um, yeah, it was sort of nautical sort of story. And then he did an SF novel called Ambassador of Progress, which was sort of fairly workaday. And then he came on board a bit more with a, a fascinating book called Night Moves, which showed the influence of Lodge, Roger Zelazny, who was very, very much big on pushing Walter John Williams at that time. There's definitely an affinity there. And what he did in that book, there were sort of things where it was about immortality, a classic Zelazny theme from Call Me Conrad, matter transmission, and there was an attempt to sort of fill an almost abandoned earth with creatures from mythology. And of course, mythology was always something that Zelazny was very big on, so you could see that there. But Williams really came into his own with these books, and particularly with Hardwired. And at that time, even then, I was thinking, well, Everybody was jumping on the cyberpunk bandwagon and was this authentic? Obviously, you know, Gibson had been there for some years and obviously Gibson would, would come in at a number one on a rank list if this were a rank list and we'll talk about him later on. Williams is more of an outsider, but Hardwired has great heart and really, what can we say about it? It's, you know, there's a lot of sort of detail in terms of the way the world is described and there's the usual corporate thing that we get and it's similar to John Shirley's work and then you've got people from the underclass sort of really sort of rising up against the corporations, a classic left-wing look at things. The plot really is interesting because I can see an influence of a Richard Morgan there and it's sort of a um, one-time corporate sort of soldier who's called Cowboy I seem to remember and of course in New Romance a case is a computer cowboy, let's see and yeah does it tell us? I'm sure it's Cowboy and it's years since I've read it and there's, you know, it's in a sort of a third person present tense. It's very immediate. So it's he does this, she does that. And you're sort of there and it's very exciting and fast moving. And, you know, there's a lot of detail. There's a lot to it. And it's, it's a good read. So if you like cyberpunk, this to me is the point where cyberpunk was really starting to become generic. And even though 
I do have questions over Williams in terms of how fully authentic it was. He really sort of stepped on the zeitgeist and did a really, really good job of it. And I would say compare him to Jack Womack, maybe that was well, who's sort of slightly later. And if you like sort of hard, fast, pacey SF adventure in the classic cyberpunk mode, you can't really go wrong with these. They're really great fun. And they've got that sort of shiny heart and lyricism, which the last knee has. So that's Williams. Hardwired as a title has been used by loads and loads of other people. And if you're sort of more turned on by, say, Count Zero, the new romancer, this would be your thing. And Williams has had an on off career since then won lots of awards, never really been a bestseller. This was his big shot. And I have to say, you know, it's, it's, it's a fun book. As I say, there is the question of authenticity, but I am very, very tough on that. Um, other ones to, to look at later on, Angel Station from 89, which I haven't pulled out, um, which is a fun book as well. There's some great short stories. And really, you know, he sort of goes in the 90s he goes more far future in a book called Ariosto which is a really sort of interesting book and that's in the um, Broderick and um, De Filippo book of the best SF novel since 1985 so that's Walter John Williams nice for those of you who haven't sort of picked him up as a cyberpunk pioneer he's in the second wave as we've invoked the cyberpunk versus humanist sort of argument of that time which was a big thing then Really, we may as well look at one of the great humanist SF writers who started his career in the 1970s, Michael Bishop. And Michael is a wonderful, wonderful literary writer. He can write anything. He can write horror. He's still with us. He's had a very tough time the last 10, 15 years. All sorts of personal issues. Great shame. Lovely, lovely man. And he really is one of the most supple and intelligent and you know cultured of the um, SF writers out there and I just want to talk about two of his key books from the 1980s first of all Ancient of Days and I'm going to put an insert in now from a video I did just about this book so you'll see that now Ancient of Days published 1985 shown here in the UK Paladin edition and the Arbor House US World First hardcover When restaurant owner Paul Lloyd takes a phone call from his commercial artist ex-wife Ruth Clare, telling him that a strange pint-sized being is sitting in a tree in her garden, he readily offers assistance. Despite the mild cynicism that Paul employs to dampen his continued attachment to Ruth Clare, he has to admit that she's correct. The mysterious visitor is a specimen of Homo habilis, one of mankind's ancestors thought to be extinct for a million years. But what is Handyman doing in the contemporary Bible Belt USA? To Paul's dismay, Ruth Claire coaxes Adam, as she calls him, into the couple's former shared home and shortly the Habiline is sharing her bed. Stifling his jealousy, Paul's sidelined role in the menage shifts when the world's scientific and tabloid press discover Adam and the local Ku Klux Klan takes an unhealthy interest in the proto-human's racial provenance. Just as Ruth Clare accepts a commission to paint a tableware set depicting the genealogical tree of the family hominidae, Adam is forced to defend himself in a manner that will have tragic consequences. Michael Bishop emerged as a leading writer of anthropological SF in the 70s, displaying his interest in human behaviour in a number of novels set on other planets. Showing an ease with social comedy written in a persuasive mainstream style, Ancient of Days tackles the question of how we define ourselves in a warm, dignified manner. Deftly ensuring that the absurd elements of Adam's spiritual transformation from net nibbler to amateur theologian never descends into slapstick, this gently amusing yet thoughtful book also conjures considerable sympathy for the ousted Paul without descending into mawkishness. Of great, great interest to anybody who likes classic modern SF is um, very much Bishop's book The Secret Ascension known in the UK as Philip K. Dick is Dead Alas and this is the world first edition of The Secret Ascension and this is the UK original of Philip K. Dick is Dead Alas. At one point there was a US trade paperback with the second title which is long gone very beautiful I remember buying this way back in the mid to late 80s and of course Philip K. Dick died in 1982 and he cast a massive shadow of the decade. He was hugely influential over all sorts of SF writers. And this is a very wonderful novel um, about Philip K. Dick as a character. And I'm not gonna tell you too much about it. It's very funny, it's very human. It's a good sort of chunky tome. And really, 
it draws on some of the ideas from Varlis and Radio Free Album Earth and as you see we've got Richard Nixon in the background there so it really really is a fantastic bit of recursive SF. Michael Bishop always worth reading wonderful pro stylist so he was somebody who I would sell consistently throughout the 80s never as many copies as I'd like I used to sell lots and lots of this and I cannot understand for the life of me why it's not in print now because it would sell purely because of the Dick connection and it's been out of print for a very long time it's a great shame so try and pick these up when you can. Then of course there was the man who fell between the cyberpunks and the humanists you know probably uh, the sort of great um, hard SF writer of the 1980s with apologies to Gregory Benford who's doing amazing work then as well but of course Greg's work sort of began really a long time before that and he was about but Greg Bay started publishing in the 70s and his work was really hot at that time I recall very very much and Blood Music and Eon when they first came out they caused big splashes great reviews good sales and what you're seeing here is the UK first hardcover of Blood Music from Golanx and the UK first hardcover of Eon there and also his collection Tangents um, very beautiful sort of Jim Burns jacket there and of course it's the same design as on Ian as you'll see this of course is a, um, a US um, book he had a very smooth best salary style and if anything that's my problem with Bear I mean I love Blood Music I've read it several times over the years and I think it's a really good book and a really important one and as it says on the cover a childhood's end for the 80s and that is very germane because it's about the transformation of mankind due to a nanos nanotechnology experiment and it is fascinating and it's, it's, it's a great book but it is written in this very smooth bestseller style and I see that as very influential over what happened in the 1990s where things got maybe a bit too smooth and a bit too bestseller -y. and we'll talk about that when we come to Kim Stanley Robinson inevitably later in this video but my first experience of Bear was I read um, Blood Music and Eon back in 1986 and I read them both in proof copy form for um, Pan Books and I work for Pan Books and they were going to put bids in for them and I said well look you really should bid on these and we, we must win them uh, but when you issue them even though Blood Music came out first get Eon out there first because it's more commercial because it's the classic big dumb object sort of novel so it has a lot of debts to things like um, Arthur C. Clarke particularly Rendezvous with Rama and Eon is about the arrival in the solar system of a sort of very sort of mysterious um, heavenly body it's an asteroid and it goes into earth orbit and it's and it ends up that it's actually an identifi identifiable sort of minor planet or planetoid Juno which is the sort of I think it's one of the sort of larger minor planets that we have in the solar system but it's not our Juno it's one from another universe and it's sort of intersected with our universe and it has all these different chambers and you go through this exploratory journey into these chambers until you get the seventh one which is like incredibly long it's virtually infinite in size and it's complex and it's interesting um, I mean for me it's not a great book I do find this kind of sense of wonder mysterious object thing rather dull and I do struggle with it but if you like that sort of thing a lot of people do you know Ringworld, Rama all those things you'd absolutely love it and it's very well written I was fond of blood music and in blood music as I say it's about a nanotechnology experiment a researcher called Virgil Ulam interesting name he's a working scientist he's working on nanotechnology and he's developing what he calls newer sites which are these sort of nanotechnological organisms and he he gets into trouble because he's sort of moonlighting he's doing it in spare time on the company and to escape the implications of the ownership and the fact that he shouldn't be doing this he injects them into his own body with interesting circumstances and in a way it reminds me of the Quater Mass experiment as well but it's a great book but there is that very smooth style as I say but Bear I mean I like Bear I'm not known for my love of hard SF I generally find it rather dull but I think I've read about 10 books by him which is a lot for me for somebody like this I mean he had a huge career and he really did so sort of you know cross the boundary and a lot of people who like literary SF like him as well sadly he died quite recently but he was an absolute giant then and I used to sell masses of Eon and Blood Music as it turned out Pan didn't win the bid the bid was won because they were Golang's hardcovers and Golang's didn't do paperbacks at that point the bids were won by Century Hutchinson and they went into Legend, the SF imprint of Arrow, which was new then. And they sold massively. And funnily enough, what did Arrow do? They published Eon first, then Blood Music, because Eon was more 
accessible. And I think there was a thought that Blood Music was maybe a little bit too innovative for the average SF reader who wanted more of the sort of Niven Clark Pornell type thing. And they were massive then, of course, as well. You have to remember that in the 80s, the people who were selling vast amounts of books, a lot of the Golden Age guys were still alive. Clark was still alive, obviously, right the way through the decade. Um, Asimov died mid 80s. He was quite young and he was producing these big sequels to the Robot and Foundation books, which critics didn't like, but I thought were actually okay. I liked them a lot. And Heinlein was around till the middle of the decade and he'd been producing big books for ages, but increasingly Heinlein was polarizing people because of his obsessions with sexuality and his rather preachy libertarian style, which didn't sit well with a lot of people. And people are still divided. Loads of people love his early work in the juveniles and are not keen on the later ones. So, you know, it is that thing. But yeah, Bear was a really sort of big guy and he, he bestrode the 80s like a colossus. And, you know, he was really, really important commercially and artistically as well, because, you know, he could write very well, it has to be said. I'm going to throw you a curveball now with a writer who first appeared in the 1960s, who was still very active in the 80s and whose spirit to me has been rather neglected when people think of the 80s in American SF, and that's Norman Spinrad, that's Little Heroes from 1987, that's a signed first edition, I bought that at the Worldcon 87 and Norman signed it for me, and as you can see as somebody with a rather muscular thewed arm, look at those veins, clutching a synclavia, and it's about sort of the spirit of rock and roll of the 60s, it's set in California and New York, and it's a book full of heart and fire and love and verve. And it's about a older woman who's been involved in the music industry for years. And she's concerned about the way that things are becoming increasingly computerized and digital and the heart and soul is falling out of rock and roll. And it's about bringing it back. And it's interesting because you see this reflected in the work of John Shirley. Um, John Shirley I covered recently in the Who Put the Punk in Cyberpunk video on the channel. And I'm not mentioning John in this video other than that. He may be in another 80s American male SF video I do as I reread more of his work. And yeah, I read this at the time and I thought, you know, Norman still got it and he's he's enormously sort of lovable and fierce. And you could also see his influence over, you could see it over the sort of hard edge political end of Gibson. You could see it over the sort of verve and flash of Walter John Williams. You could see it through lots of these writers. And Norman's a popular writer. He always sort of aimed at a popular audience but never talked down to anybody and he's never deliberately inaccessible but always quite literary as well and Little Heroes is a really great romp it's great fun and you really have to feel for him and his characters and he paints them with such vivid strokes and even the bad ones are really well done you know and he he just cares a lot and he's got a real rock and roll heart so if um, you remember that period where music was becoming increasingly electronic acoustic instruments suddenly disappeared all of a sudden if you even look at bands like yes where did the acoustic guitar go you know we had a strange resurgence of horns probably caused by david bowie's let's dance but they were sort of really compressed and horrible and that popped up in all sorts of things in the mid 80s but this is a novel about the spirit of rock and roll the spirit of rebellion and how in the 80s and into the near future it could be carried forward and, you know, maybe one day we'll do a little video about rock and roll um, SF novels because there are some interesting ones out there and they tend to have a lot of heart and a lot of love in them. They're not always as gritty as they need to be, but Norman is always gritty. So I see Norman's spirit as one of the sort of people he kept on going. Other people seem to fade away. Bradbury had really faded away by that point. He was treading water. Ellison seemed to be writing more fantasy stories and was relying on the past. He was falling out with a lot of the major publishers. Norman kept on going. Right into the 90s, he was doing really interesting stuff, you know, and, and he he sort of became too radical for the mainstream eventually, you know, and now, you know, he's sort of out in the cold self-publishing, but still out there. Great, great guy. Little heroes pick it up. I remember selling this in modest quantities in the 80s. It was a B format paperback. It was a Paladin. It was um, it was a sort of HarperCollins Grafton sort of thing. And really it didn't have very good marketing, whatever. And as you see, this is such an 80s cover. Can you remember having wallpaper like that? Except it was probably black, red and grey. And it probably came from somewhere like the poster store, Athena. There you go. Norman Spinrad, Little Heroes. Somebody who started publishing short stories in the early 80s and who 10 years later was winning awards left, right and centre well into the 90s. His name was always coming up 
in awards was Michael Swanick, a very interesting writer and somebody who I feel in the past I've underrated and here's just a couple of Michael's novels and In the Drift was the first one and that appeared in I think it was magazine stories first and it was fixed up round about um, 84. I don't think it appeared in the UK till a couple of years afterwards. I remember selling it as a trade paperback. That's a UK first hardcover and it's a very interesting thing because it combines the post-apocalyptic nuclear thing with an alternate world and the the sort of nuclear apocalypse in this is it's the alternate world has caused it because what's happened is that Three Mile Island the famous sort of nuclear meltdown at the power station that actually goes awry and you know <laughs> it all blows and melts down and that causes the apocalypse and that affects the USA which of course is not what happened in our world so it's very interesting him combining those two things and there's the UK's kind of balkanized and split up into tiny sort of states and protectorates and what have you. It doesn't always hang together brilliantly, but it is fascinating as a mosaic novel looking at it. And I love the title In the Drift. And the thing about Swanick is he's a really good storyteller in that he's very muscular and clear. And he's sort of, he's not, not melodramatic about the way he does things. He, there's a sort of matter of factness. And yet at the same time, there is a sort of affinity with people like, I think some critics have said he's rather like Gene Wolfe in that there's a kind of mythic thing going on, but a bit more direct than Gene Wolfe. And I think almost everybody's more direct than Gene Wolfe if we get down to it. And we'll talk about Gene Wolfe another time. I'm rather holding off about talking about Wolfe because there's a lot to be saying. And I want, I want to say something different about him and I need to do some rereading because he is a complex character, but back to Swanick. But yeah, in The Drift is a good one. So that was a debut really. Um, but a few years later, this is M87, this is Vacuum Flowers. This is probably his most acclaimed early book and this is a Arbor House US first. And I've just reread some of this, first time in years. And um, you know, great title, very cyberpunk sort of title. And he got tagged onto that as well, but he really did understand it. And what I like about this book is that it does that classic corporate versus underdog thing it's about a young woman who ends up in a, a different body. So there's a kind of reference to Tipri there and she has different personalities and she's gone through various traumas and the plot is quite complex to explain. But the beauty of it is the Swanick does it in such easy strokes and, you know, his exposition is excellent. You know, he, he manages to get these information across to you in dialogue and it was, which never feels forced or unreal. You know, he's really good at exposition. It's particularly good in Vacuum Flowers. And you rarely meet a science fiction reader who doesn't like vacuum flowers. It's, it really is one of the sort of top ones, really. And it's great stuff. Uh, you know, there's sort of like an AI thing is present and it tends to run the earth. And, you know, it is all about sort of jacking in and people's personas being affected by virtual states. And he's very, very good at background color and detail and sort of picking, depicting sort of a chaotic graffiti strewn world and there's some really memorable sequences in this and that fed very well into his later book from the 90 stations of the tide which i've mentioned before which i put in my book 100 must read science fiction novels and i've always had a conflict in my heart between that and should i put hyperion in and i didn't and i think at the time i was thinking swanick won so many awards and he was interesting start kind of faded after that he's about 73 you know he's still out there and I do think, you know, he's somebody who I've gone back to and I really think he's much better than I thought. So it's, it's fascinating stuff. So if you haven't read him and you're interested in cyberpunk, this is a guy who took some of this stuff on and he meshed it with more traditional SF concerns. But he did it in a way which never felt forced or trying to be cool. Swanick never tried to be cool. He didn't have to. He was just matter of fact about it. And I think that's the problem with a lot of the sort of early sort of more cliched cyberpunk narratives that come in the wake of Gibson and Sterling and Shirley is that you can almost feel the writers are trying to be cool and there's a lot of surface and I see this in the work of Richard Cadry who writes really beautifully and you know the surface is fantastic but you wonder is there really anything under it well in Swanick there is and I would say if you've not read him before I mean the drift is good but Vacuum Flowers really is a fantastic book I know Matt Defoe at Science Fiction Reads loved it and I don't think it's dated at all I think it's really retained its, its heart and his charm and the easy exposition, good characterization and wonderful background color, Michael Swanick. Then we come on to a writer who has increasingly become divisive and he started his career in the 70s, he's a Mormon and 
you know some critics i mean norman spinner particularly says that he feels the cards earlier books are better i'll be honest and say i've not read enough of the earlier ones to really say but there was no avoiding orson scott card in the 80s none whatsoever and ender's game um this year is a it's not a first edition this is a revised edition from about 95 it's the first less of that and it's a us one very big as you can see but ender's game i've read a few times and it is a compelling read it's also a very manipulative one i feel and this is its immediate sequel speaker for the dead and of course it succumbed to even more sequels and so on i didn't really want to read beyond this i felt this was quite dull compared to the first one even though arguably it's a deeper book but for those of you who if you don't know this book and i'm sure you probably do ender's game is set it's rather like starship troopers in a way there's an alien threat to earth and there are these um, arthropod type aliens who are called the buggers with all the implications that has for English speaking readers who know the actual meaning of the word it has a sexual meaning of course and they are bugs so it's rather like starship troopers and it also has resonances with the forever war as well so I tend to sort of see it in the same ballpark as those things and the young people of earth are being selected the most promising for battle situations strategic situations and they're being trained on board a um orbital sort of spacecraft thing whatever you want to call it. i can't remember the exact details but they're being trained on board a space habitat and they're playing all sorts of games and their combat games to see who's going to be the future leaders as the war is going to go on for some time so rather like the forever war and it's very sort of interesting and the central character Ender Wiggin where do they get these names from who's going to be called Ender Wiggin after all has a sister called Valentine and a brother called Peter and the three of them are kind of like in opposition and Peter's sort of the outsider he's more rapacious and they seem to all occupy different parts of the political spectrum and that is something which widens out throughout the novel and especially in Speaker for the Dead its sequel and there is a great sort of conceptual breakthrough moment towards the end of the novel where you realize that what's been happening isn't entirely what you think it is and it's something else but the whole thing about Ender's Game is that it's got a heck of a lot in it you know it's got this invasion um, and the potential war it's got the whole idea of you know how do you deal with an intelligence which isn't human but is in which is nonetheless as a civilization it covers issues like genocide is that does the means justify the end this sort of rivalry among siblings this rivalry amongst the kids in the space school you know it's the nature of different sorts of political figures from soci sociopaths to empaths and the power dynamic in that this stuff about the family and you know there's all sorts of Heinlein stuff in there about you know what sort of society do you have where militarism is really sort of important and it's a fascinating read it's an easy read he's not a fantastic pro stylist it's very straight ahead there's a famous film as you probably know and I have to say I found it very manipulative and you know there's nothing wrong with that you know a writer is there to entrance you and to put you into a world and to make you ask questions it's also very prescient there's a lot about social media message boards in these particularly in the second one but it does come up in the first one and how some of the characters and radiuses begin to influence people politically and that's very prescient indeed because that's exactly what we've seen on the internet the last 15 years so you can't not read it do i like the book probably not from a political point of view is it right wing well i think i actually think in lots of ways you know card is very sort of even-handed and presented different points of view and it, you know it's not sort of simple questions he does ask complex questions and he manages to do it in sort of a very sort of interesting adventure narrative which young people can read part of the big problem with ender's game for me is that as an adult reader it has one big problem and it's full of adolescence but there's no mention of sex and it's very interesting because of course not everybody who's an adolescent is sexually active but it will at least cross your mind and it just seemed very unrealistic to me and other than the sort of freudian giveaway of the buggers you know it really is quite seems unrealistic that way but i think court card maybe maybe he's a bit of a prude you know he has said some conservative things you know it's entirely up to him what he wants to put in a book if he didn't feel that was appropriate there is an atom edition of ender's game atom of course is the children's imprint of um let's see of orbit in the uk and i sold masses and masses and masses of these in the 80s and they've been selling masses ever since 
I do think they're interesting books. They're very influential. You couldn't avoid them. And out of the books we're looking at today, they're certainly amongst the, the best selling ones. I remember vividly voting for Gibson to win the Hugo for Mona Lisa Overdrive in 87. And I think Speaker for the Dead one. <laughs> I was gutted because I really wanted a more sophisticated work with a great polished surface and something which I felt had more depth and was more realistic and had more to say um, than Card had to say. But you know, Card had big things to say in broad strokes and they are worth revisiting and I'm going to reread them again one day. I've read Ender's Game at least three times, maybe four. I've read Speaker for the Dead twice. And I've never read Xenocide, the third. I really didn't, I thought, you know, this is just turning into another endless sequence. And I didn't want to go there. It's diminishing returns. But you can't avoid them if you want to read 80s SF. And I would say the three dominant figures in a commercial sense out of male writers in 80s SF out of America would have been Bear, Card and Gibson. So, you know, they were like the big three of their time, very, very much so. And, you know, they're still selling loads and loads of books today. It has to be said. Somebody I've mentioned on the channel a lot because I'm very fond of his early work particularly and who was a presence throughout the 80s and beyond and who yet never really sold as many books as he should have even though he was a pioneer. And this is often the way when it comes to pioneers and he was a pioneer of cyberpunk. He helped put the punk into it as I said in my video on who put the punk in cyberpunk which I'm mentioning here for the second time to get you to watch it. And that's Bruce Sterling and here we see Crystal Express which is a collection of short stories and Islands in the Net which is a late 80s novel by him both in beautiful legend UK editions and I've talked a lot about Bruce's early work on the channel so I'm not going to go into that I am going to talk about Schismatrix briefly which I'm not showing here which is a paperback um, from Penguin about 85 and Schismatrix is a collection of linked stories it's kind of a future history thing and it posits two future cultures against each other. So if you like the Ian Banks culture thing, then you should really read Schismatrix. And there are two types of people in that future, the Shapers and the Mechanists. And the Shapers believe in genetic engineering and evolution and changing the human body through biological means. And there's the Mechanists, who are the more cyberpunk thing, they're more plugged in, jacked in, cyborg you up, what have you, and bioengineering versus prosthetics, I guess. And they are, you know, they're really good stories and fully realized worlds and just beautiful background detail. And they really are quite something. And in a lot of ways, they're more sophisticated and they're further future, I would say, than Gibson's stories. And they're sort of less well known. It's a shame, really. So there are other ones which are vaguely connected in a collection of Global Head. And Schismatrix, I think, is out of print now, which is a shame. There was a trade paperback called Schism Schismatrix Plus, which I think contained all of those stories. So they are sort of worth looking at. And there's a kind of Stapledonian thing to them as well. So, you know, and Bruce also did at the end of the 80s, 1990, he did the sort of key steampunk novel, The Difference Engine, with his old mate um, Bill Gibson. And that's a good one as well. But really, these things are the ones which tend to be more ignored. So do look at his short stories. They're really, really good. Get what you can. And Islands in the Net. Well, yeah, this is a kind of quasi-utopian one. A beautiful book, as you see. And I'm just going to have a look at it because it's been a while. And it's set in 2023, which is where we are now, of course. Isn't that lovely? And uh, the thing is, it's about a woman called Laura. And she is sort of like, you know, it's fairly utopian. Nuclear weapons being banned, the environmental crisis, and, you know, is sort of being dispelled. Politics settled down a lot. And, you know, the, the internet, a global telecommunication system using technology pied in the late 20th century. There you go. Of course, Bruce knew it was coming. It sort of gives you all sorts of things as activities, friendship, support, as it says in the jacket blurb. So it is about the internet. You could see that coming. Uh, but this is about the real people in this sort of future web life world. And, you know, as with all utopias, there is a thorn at the center of the rose and it examines that. And I'd say, I'm not going to tell you too much about it because it's, it, I'll admit it's been a long time since I read it, but I really enjoyed it. And it's Bruce probably at his sunniest and most Spinradian in lots of ways. And it's a neglected book. So if you haven't really gone to Bruce and you've done Gibson, you really should. And you know, the, the variety of his work across the late 70s and the 80s is really, really good. And probably I would say, you know, if, you, if you're going to do one, probably just do Schisma Tricks. But I'm very fond of Islands of the Net. I really enjoyed it when I read it. And it was a really good foil to me to the slightly drier, more anodyne humanist work of Kim Stanley Robinson and the good thing about Bruce is that he is a cyberpunk 
and you know he was a revolutionary figure and he was so hardcore but he managed to suck all those things in as well so you know i actually think it's really really good so it's it becomes sort of thrillery it can be quite tense at times as well and you are getting that thing where the internet is gradually being leached over by political and corporate power so it's very relevant for what's happening now and very precise you could see it coming so bruce you know a real visionary great stuff so do try and pick up others of the net i think it's out of print probably shouldn't be too too hard to get but if you've read the other things of his i've talked about if you've talked if you've read involution ocean the artificial kid great early cyberpunk book if you've read schisma tricks if you haven't you must islands of the net is probably the next stop and the short stories are good as well now a writer who back in the 80s was a kind of second stringer he did a lot of work and he got a fair amount of attention he didn't become a bestseller till the 90s with his famous mars trilogy which you know of course we're talking about kim stanley robinson and i'm going to be quite critical of kim because i think he he has many great novelistic virtues but more than anybody i would say he is more responsible for the kind of smooth best salary overcasted side of 90s american sf where everything got very slick and things were like sort of airport novels with a supposed glittery sort of glittering edge which they often didn't have and i do see kim's influence as being sort of predominant over this so i'm gonna be quite critical of him but he was important still is still sells tons of books he produces these massive things now which i really have no time for i see them and i sort of shrink up and shrivel inside so we're going to look at the early works and um the interesting thing about the 80s is that it doesn't really get going to about 83 84 and then there's this huge explosion and it all centers around this whole cyberpunk thing when neuromancer came along in 84 it wasn't a paperback in the uk till 86 huge sort of explosion things so it's really this is really sort of like the late 80s and these guys mostly were doing short stories in the early 80s not that they're insignificant the short stories are important so what you see here on the left is the uk hardcover first edition of the wild shore from mcdonald now in the states that was published as a paperback original in terry carr's ace special series and that's quite an uncommon book i don't have one if i ever get one i'll show it to you that was the first edition that's the uk first and my immediate feeling on reading that is ursula legan and then of course you get the second in the series and we're talking about a thematic trilogy they're not a series where you follow the same characters all the way through in one chronological timeline it doesn't work that way and yet you do in a way because they are closely related the thematic trilogy looking at different utopian or dystopian situations primarily utopian and i'm going to talk about a bit so this is the gold coast and that's the us first edition from tor and this is the uk first edition from orbit which as you see is a trade paperback beautiful jacket i enjoyed this one i like this book and enjoyed it at the time always wanted a hardcover like this there was never a hardcover in that livery which is a great shame so these are the first two i'm not going to show you the third one which is pacific edge because that wasn't published till 1990 but we can cover it a bit in talking about this so the wild shore you know it's it's quite long it's, it's a bit sort of leaden i would say at times the characterization sort of really is gradual and slow and it's not a book which really punches you in the gut you know it's sort of rather there's a post-holocaust situation it's rather pastoral and genteel so it makes you think of things like pat frank's alas babylon it makes you think of things like davy by edgar pangborn fantastic book but it doesn't really build on that and it is humanist it's about people people's relations and what have you but it's not really a very exciting book and the weird thing about kim is that at the time he and writers who came up, up in the 90s people saying oh you know this is more subtle it's more well crafted it's more literary well was it as i say to me they're like airport novels there's too many characters you know very measured and stately and mature but it lacked something it like lacked the verve and pizzazz and spirit of sf that gonzoid idiot energy as brian eno would call it which was there in new romancer and gibson's work and stillman's work without any diminution of literary quality and let's face it you know you can do those things and have style i mean gibson is the master of that and robinson isn't it i find his stuff rather gray and dull um but, you know, maybe that's just me but his heart is good you know he's looking at interesting things and utopian communities and in this one this is set in the 21st century and where that the series is dramatic is that you have characters 
who recur, but they have different names. They're not the same characters, but they occupy similar sort of positions to each other in relationships. And the Pacific Edge focuses a lot around water supplies in a future pastoral Californian utopia, and it's incredibly dull. Gold Coast is more sort of high tech, and this depiction here of you know big cities and freeways and what have you is more like it. And it's obviously it's Orange County, you know, a rich hot part of California and um, this is a much better and it centers on a guy called Jim who sort of like this feels sort of a bit out of place in the future and his father works in military research and Jim is sort of rather rootless but then he gets inadvertently involved with sort of minor sort of works of terrorism and you know there's this dynamic where there's this Brett Easton Ellis type thing where he goes up with mates you know and they're all immaculately dressed and everything's absolutely great you know and it, you, you do get this sort of thing where the sort of the, the rich and the and the comfortable get easily bored and drawn into radicalism in this and it's a long time since I've read it but I did enjoy it and there is that ambiguous thing about the beauty of the utopian society and the thing and gradually father and son come into conflict and that's that's pretty well done actually and there are great moments in the wild shore you know and gene wolf liked it but um yeah i i I'd rather felt it was rather like um Lagan's always coming home you know a little bit too worthy and dull so that was kim's sort of beginning of the, the thematic trilogy and obviously you could see the concerns you know the concern for wider society is building up even then Possibly of more interest to traditional SF readers are some fairly early books. Say Wild Shore was the first one, shortly after that came Ice Henge, which is a bit more of a typical, more mysterious, labyrinth, big dumb object type thing. But it is underrated and it's worth a look. And I think with Kim, a lot of his stuff, people haven't read the really early works. So these are formative things where he's feeling his way. And even though he starts a Wild Shore, which is more typical of what he would work towards in his humanist sort of aspect, you know, these are worth looking at as well. The one I like the most from these is The Memory of Whiteness, which is very, it's sort of subtitled Scientific Romance and it's set in the, I think it's the, I think 3200 or something, it's set quite distant future, and Memory of Whiteness. And it's about this huge and diverting musical instrument called the orchestra. And there's a lot of romanticism in it, and there's a lot about music and psychology, and it's got a very broad sweep, it's set in outer space. And it's absolutely fascinating stuff. I'm picking it up now because it makes me want to reread it. And this is one of one of my favourite books of the time. Is somebody who is a composer, and they are fascinated by this, um, this this machine, the orchestra, and it goes all across the solar system. And yeah, it is quite sort of visionary and um, and colourful. And this is him at his most romantic. So if you want something that's between the humanism, the romanticism, it is about art. Um, and in that way, you know, it's a very sort of valid book. I really rate The Memory of Whiteness and um, I enjoyed reading it. And I think if you like Dan Simmons, I mean, if you like Hyperion, I'd certainly say go with Memory of Whiteness. They're very different in lots of ways, but there's something about the tone of the writing of Memory of Whiteness. So when I first read Hyperion, I immediately flashed on this book and flashed back to it. And I thought, mm, there's a kind of muscularity and verve and liveliness and a kind of softness of touch really. So, you know, as you see, I'm going from rather damning the wild shore to sort of waxing lyrical about memory of whiteness. And um, there are sort of parts of it which are not quite mature and they don't feel quite authentic. But at the same time, I would say, don't miss it, you know, do go back. So if you look at Kim's early work and what he was doing in the eighties, he was trying different things, trying something fairly traditional, trying a utopian novel, which was more in line with his future concerns and something which really didn't get matched again in his oeuvre, Memory of Whiteness. That's the one for me. So Kim Stanley Robinson, for me a divisive figure, but nonetheless still an interesting one and key to the 1980s. Lewis Shiner, and now we are talking. This is a book which I'm ashamed to say I didn't read at the time because I looked at the cover, I thought, oh, that looks like the same old, same old. The title Frontera interested me a bit because Frontera is the title of a song by Phil Manzanera from Roxy Music, a song I really like. It means Frontier, of course, and it was published by Sphere. There was no hardcover. There's never been a hardcover of this book, which drives me mad because I love it. I didn't read it a long time afterwards. I read other things by Shiner 
towards the end of the 80s but this came out about 86 and uh, all i can say about this is there is a horrible print under man trade and pay trade paperback in print get it and read it anyway because it's fantastic this is one of my favorite books of the 80s and this has got all the hard edge stuff of kw jeter it's got the flash and grit of gibson and of course shiner was in mirror shades the cyberpunk anthology but you know he never stands still lewis he does different things all the time and you know he's he's great great writer but the problem is when you do different things all the time people can't put you in a box publishers don't know what to do with you and i'm not blaming him i really celebrate his his verve and his attitude and doing what he wants as a writer that's the way art should be unfortunately commerce doesn't always intersect and this was a book which really really should have had a lot more acclaim and it had some acclaim it did reasonably well but man i don't know why i didn't read it at the time i really wish i had that was a real fail on my part so you can blame me for it not being an international success but frontier is an amazing book it's pure sf it's about a colony on mars which has been set up a long time before the action of the book and the colony is called frontera and it's been abandoned by the corporation that set it up and they've left the sort of colonists there to deal with the harsh environment and they hire this guy called Kane, who's just sort of typical cyberpunk outsider, down on his luck figure, to, you know, basically go to Mars and to bring something back for them. And what is it? Well, you will find out. And Kane has these wonderful sort of <laughs> hard-edged adventures. He has to sort of go in this very rickety spaceship that's virtually falling apart. You know, you can basically see the rivets dropping out of it. And he ends up on Mars and boy, it catches fire. It really is like the brain-burned intensity of Philip K. Dick, as a critic once said, combined with bags of attitude and with the abrasive roughness of Cheetah and a kind of steely fire and gleam which is Shiner's own and you know he's somebody who's very capable he's a very capable literary writer he can write mainstream novels his character insights are great he's a real child of the 60s in lots of ways his second novel is a book called Deserted Cities of the Heart which is kind of magical realist fantasy thing and that was good as well and I remember reading that and thinking wow this is really quite something but I say every book he did was different his third novel is a great book called Slam which is about a middle-aged tax dodger who comes out of prison in Galveston in Texas and falls in with some skate punk kids and that's a great countercultural novel I love Slam and you know and he just kept moving from one thing to another you know and part of the problem with that I say is you don't get any success but this is pure SF it's cyberpunk up to a point it reminds me a lot of the work of david cronenberg as well i've already cited philip k dick because when he gets to mars he confronts the colonists and something has been happening to them and boy is it really really great it's a fantastic pure punk rock sf novel i can't speak highly enough about it it makes me very very excited um and really i just i just think it should be a colonized masterwork and I, I i do lose words and i think about how exciting i find it because it really is quite something i've read it twice i've read it for a long time i want to read it again it is the great lost and neglected pure sf novel of the 80s it makes walter john williams hardwired seem soft it's got all the toughness of John Shirley, but it's better written than John's work. Sorry, John, but I think that's true. I think you'd agree. Lewis really is quite a wonderful pro stylist. And he could so easily have had a career as a mainstream novelist. You know, his work is the equivalent of people like Lee Kennedy, who write really beautifully, who sort of toyed with SF in the 80s and Frontera. It ticks all the boxes and then some. So if you like Silverberg, Dick, Jeter, Gibson, all those hard, fast, sharp, intelligent, heartfelt people with lots of big themes within within their work, then Frontera is the one for you. Lewis Shiner, Frontera, the most neglected SF novel of the 80s and one of the very finest. Am I saving the best for last? Well, this is the sort of last but one and you'll know what the top one is. It's not a rank list, but uh, let's just say the sort of last three are, are, the, are the ones I would pick above all others. And we come to Lucia Shepherd. What can we say? Lucia Shepherd, neglected these days, no longer with us, of course. Very sad. His first novel, Green Eyes, on the left there, the UK hardcover. This is the world first hardcover of Green Eyes. There was never a US one. That again was a Terry Carr, a special in the third A special series, his debut novel. Then in the centre, The Jaguar Hunter, his first collection of short stories. The one on the left is the Arkham House one with the J.K. Potter illustrations. 
and the one on the right is the Paladin UK first paperback and yeah as you can see Paladin being marketed as a mainstream collection rather than a genre one and Paladin did a lot of that when they moved over to fiction finally in 86 after being around since the 60s and 86 they moved over to fiction and they were doing things like Michael Bishop, Philip K. Dick, several other writers who were associated with with SF as well and there's some lovely work and sadly not much of it sort of took on the Dick ones did. Shepard was always somebody who was for more refined tastes and literary sophisticated so what i'm going to do now i'm going to just put an insert in from another video which talks about his novel life during wartime life during wartime 1987 shown here in the original uk hardcover first edition from grafton published as a mainstream novel and then as a paladin b format paperback a year later i have very vivid memories of buying this um, late in I think it was 87 let's just check what it says I know where I was working I'm not sure if it was before or after Christmas let's just have a quick look at the rear of the full title page and yeah published 1988 so it was 1987 in the USA what did I write about that back um, in 100 must read science fiction novels in 2006 David Mingola is one of thousands of US military advisors serving in insurgent Guatemala. Central America is the new Vietnam. The efficiency of stateside troops expanded by cutting edge stimulants and the surgically altered Psycor, whose air cav division is perpetually disguised by smoky visors that are rumored to hide their disfigurements. These flaky cowboy berserkers exert an uncomfortable fascination for Mignola claiming to predict the future and annihilate the enemy by thought alone. After a traumatic raid by Cuban guerrillas on Mingola's base, the young artilleryman is trying to enjoy some R&R &R when one of his tense homeboys insists that their squad needs to desert to evade combat casualty before losing grip and being gunned down by military police. Mingola feels his own grip on the situation loosening when he encounters the sultry native Deborah while gambling in an unusual tombola game. Drawn to the haunted sword of his natural ESP facility, she too states that unless Mingola avoids the future she foresees, he will die. But Mingola's experiences only encourage him to join Psycho and pursue an inexorable journey toward the end of the night. Obvious parallels with Apocalypse Now and Joseph Conrad are entirely appropriate. Life During Wartime stands up beside such masterworks because of the quality of the writing and the subtlety of the SF approach. Highly praised in broadsheet reviews when first published, it built on Shepard's reputation for existential exploration of the soul in exotic settings. His previous work had already been compared to that of the Latin American magical realists. Despite the neotropical jungle backdrop of the book and its voluptuous prose, the book is more akin to early Ballard or Celine than Marquez. Life During Wartime has similarities and differences, both in content and style, to Shepard's cyberpunk contemporaries that illustrate perfectly the fascinity of 1980s SF. And it's true, American SF in the 80s was just astonishing, particularly once you get to about 85, 86, there's some fantastic stuff going on. The novel takes its title from a talking head song, and the book is a fearsome trip into a psychedelic heart of darkness, when that Shepard is most qualified to lead and that fans of nightmarish combat horror films will eagerly follow. So Life During Wartime is probably his most accessible place in his 80s over and he moved on and did many other things beyond that. He wrote fantasy as well. Green Eyes, I'm very fond of Green Eyes, his first novel and this is a, I see this is a pristine Panther A format first. Isn't that beautiful? And it looks like a horror novel and that's because in a way it is, and though there are affinities with Shepard to things like, I would say in Green Eyes, it is about sort of increasing intelligence. So in a way it is similar to sort of Camp Concentration or Flowers for Algernon, but it has that wonderful jungle feel. And as I say, Shepard very much set things in exotic locales. He traveled a lot. He'd been involved in rock and roll and dope smuggling. And you know, the writing is, is just there really. It's, it's beautiful stuff. And the whole thing about green eyes is that 
it is a zombie narrative so you know when you pick it up and even then you know you pick it up and you'd read it and you'd think of Lucio Fulci's Zombie Flesh Eaters or Zombie Due, Zombie 2, to give it the correct title. And you'd think of those sort of things, but of course this wasn't sort of your cannibal ghouls, this was something different. And it's set in the sort of swamp sort of states of the US and you know it's just about an experiment to raise the dead it's got a background conspiracy thing which is, involves the CIA and it's got things which all sound very cliched but they're actually sort of really good and basically it's about trying to resurrect people and somebody who's been resurrected his vision is particularly acute and it, it, he becomes more intelligent and it's because of this virus that he's been infected with so you know there are all, all these kickbacks to things like i am legend as well you know so there is a, it is a sort of zombie narrative but not a flesh-eating ghoul narrative and it's interesting and with shepherd it's the texture you can feel the heat you can taste the sweat running down off your brow into bringing the salt into your mouth and you feel like you need a good shave when you've read that read them and they're full of all sorts of the heart of darkness which is just sublime and the color is there the romance is there the darkness is there so even if you like things like hp lovecraft which are a lot more lurid this is thick stylistic writing this is stuff that you sort of wade through a bit and i stepped away from shepherd in the early 90s so i felt like kind of had enough of that and that he was setting these things after his fourth book kalamantan which is a novella which i thought was a little bit too arch and lacking in clarity at times i stepped back from that but i did return to him later and these are kind of the keynote works really his 80s work you know he was just like people would read him and they would freak i think it was damon knight red green eyes and, and he wrote a piece in a magazine or something saying you know at the moment i'm one of only 12 people in the world who realize that this guy's a genius and before long there'll be you know hundreds of thousands of us so and did it happen that way lots of acclaim lots of awards never a bestseller rarefied taste if you buy the jaguar hunter there are two editions the us edition and the uk edition and there was a hardcover edition from Kerosino, which is very beautiful which i don't have to hand it's here somewhere it's hidden behind a pile of other books and it's got this so this is on the cover but it, it's got a blue surround it's very beautiful try and pick up the Kerosino one if you can maybe jim goddard's got a spare you never know and leaky boot press so there is differences um there's three stories in there which are not in there and vice versa and I think those adjustments were made because I think in this one, I think R&R &R is in this one and R&R &R is a large part of life during wartime. So Shepard, the true stylist of 80s SF alongside Gibson, the master, and probably in the sense of creeping over towards the mainstream, the most important writer here. Because I remember very well when Life During Wartime came out and we had six copies into the shop I worked in and I was very excited to snap it up and read it because I'd read um, Green Eyes and I picked up the Jaguar Hunter at the Royal Con and thought it was amazing. So it was a new book, it was really exciting. And it had that Talking Heads title as well. And I was a big Talking Heads fan. And my boss had gone out to lunch and he'd read a review in the Times and he came back and he said, wow, he said, they're really raving about that book you just bought. They say it's a real masterpiece, you know, and it invokes Conrad and Ballard and all these things. And I said, yeah, you know, he's really good, Brian. You know, he's really good. I don't know if Brian ever actually read him, but Shepard really is somebody you should read if you like great writing per se. And sadly neglected these days. Lucia Shepard, Green Eyes, The Jaguar Hunter, Life During Wartime. What an immaculate trilogy of works to open with. the obvious and inevitable number one and the correct one really i mean there can be no other nobody changed sf so much nobody drew a straight line between the past and the future nobody upset the order that had emerged of new wave and hard sf merging in american sf but not always leading to great results to the new wave bleeding into literary fiction in the uk you know genre sf needed new blood and it needed innovation and boy we got it yes they were precursors dick delaney bester moorcock budress you know tiptree jr plenty of them but this is the guy who took it and ran with it he put the punk into cyberpunk influenced by the velvet underground the beat generation and the best of glittering new wave 
SF from Besta onwards and you know Bill Gibson the trilogy represented here by the 10th anniversary Collins edition that's my reading copy apparently I'm told by Andy Richards of Cold Tonnage books very scarce and he had one recently and sold it for 400 quid I sold my first UK paperback of it for I think it was 90 something pounds maybe a little bit more than 90 something quid um, because I've got various copies of it and these are all signed and that's a first edition there of Count Zero in Golanx in a little Crown Octavo and the first edition of Mona Lisa Overdrive also from Golanx which of course they put into a demi so you know try and get a, a complete run with the same livery forget it it's not going to ha happen the great cyberspace trilogy the sprawl trilogy call it what you will and was there a diminution of impact well Neuromancer is no perfect Count Zero is great great book he wasn't going to do the same thing again I find Bobby a really interesting character the way that his mum is, is sort of there but off off sort of camera brings an element of realism into it there's the kidnapping thing the corporate thing that's very cool and measured and the overdrive you know really sort of takes it into the sort of widest wider sort of scope of things really and something I really like in only silver drive is the way that London is depicted with the oriental young girl there and the way that London is still like old London it's still rainy it's still grim it's still wet it's fantastic stuff so you know these books bestrode the time like the Colossus and people are still reading them now and you know the first time I read Neuromancer I thought what is this about what is going on I could barely understand what was happening but the surface sheen was there the characterization was there the romanticism was there all the meat and all it wants you know the love story was there the vertiginous plotting the excitement of traditional sf with new tropes mail come when he's jacked in by case babylon all those wonderful moments case never saw molly again the wonderful opening line the wonderful closing line it gets called Chandler-esque, often by people who've never read Chandler, you know, but there's an element of truth in it. There is the, the hardness of noir, the wonderful plotting, the comments it makes about reality and virtual reality and searching for the sublime. And the way that Gibson, when he saw those kids playing arcade games, wanted to get behind the screen. It had been in Tron and it was very much the zeitgeist. It was in Tron and, he, and Gibson saw rushes and early shoots from um, Blade Runner and he thought god you know this is the world I'm writing about I've got to get my skates on nobody did it quite the same and of course there's the collection Burning Chrome and that contains the other sprawl stories it contains Johnny Monomic fantastic stuff New Rose Hotel and the title story it was hot the night we burned chrome and you know it's just poetry there's no reason why SF shouldn't have this wonderful axiomatic writing which is sophisticated and downbeat and at the same time elevates the soul it's kind of the equivalent of the sisters of mercy it's like a machine it's glittering it's hard it's got all the weight of western culture and you know we try and clone them up but they always croak again and again i read neuromancer nearly every year and i guess something different of each time it's a love story it's a thriller it has all the elements of great storytelling and it changed things and the other books are not to be discounted and you know you, you read things like new rose hotel with a guy in the hotel room planning his suicide and oh god it really does get under your skin so it is fantastic stuff and gibson really he provided that link between hard sf and the new wave in a true sense and really moved things on and i say all the time in work that Neuromancer is the most important SF novel of the last 40 years. It's 40 years old next year. Nothing has supplanted it. Nothing, I can't see anything supplanting it because the paradigm hasn't moved on enough from them. You get to the 80s and you get the sort of post-humanists and you get people like Rajanimi and Charles Stross. They're a bit later on and you know Greg Egan and things and you know they're doing interesting stuff Werner Vinge but I mean people talk about the true names you know the inventor of cyberspace but you read the true names and you read this and there's a difference this is literature and that is what it's all about this is high art what else can be said about Neuromancer an awful lot is said almost too much I almost want to stop talking about it because I think it's hard to get fresh insights you just need to read it and dive in and relish it 
It's a wonderful, life-affirming book with lots of horrible things in it. There's lots of crime in it, lots of terrible things in it, but it remains one of the pinnacles of our literary culture. So that's my take on probably the most important male American SF authors of the 1980s. And it was, as I say, a really exciting time. And I was working there and I was really enjoying it. There was so much great stuff. There's a lot going on. There was wonderful things in the UK. Priest, Ballard, you had new writers coming up. You had Interzone. You had the hard space opera Renaissance began in 87 with Banks and Greenland. And you had all this wonderful stuff as well. And it really was an embarrassment of riches. And we were coming to the end of the modernist period we didn't know it there were signs the word postmodern was coming up things were becoming more electronic smoother the acoustic textured reality of the world was dropping away and the simulacri were growing and growing and we still had this fantastic writing of all kinds and I, I really don't think American SF or SF generally has recovered since the 80s it was an astonishing time people could say it's just because you were young it wasn't there's was more to it than that at the end of the 80s, in 1990, I was 27, so I was only 26, um, 20, 26 as the decade began. So that goes to show I was still young, but I could see the things were changing and that they would never be the same. And within three years, I stepped away from SF because I was disenchanted with the lack of forward movement. Maybe these guys took it as far as they could. If you haven't read them, do read them. Think of them in that context. Think of MTV, which we didn't have in the UK. We hear about it all the time. We didn't have it. Think of what was happening with Thatcherism in the UK and Reaganomics in the US. Think of the changes in music, in culture. It was an astonishingly rich time. I was younger then, yeah. I was having a great time. I'm a child of the 70s. I was born in the 60s. The 70s is the decade I would go back to. But boy, I had a great time in the 80s. And a lot of it was to do with these guys and the wonderful work they came up with. And of course, there were great female writers as well. And there are people we haven't covered today, like Jita and F. Inger and many, many others. And we will get them on the channel. So I hope you've enjoyed that. I hope you dive into the people you haven't read. I suspect the people you're least likely to have read will be Shepard and Shiner. Do give them a go. All of these people are worth reading, even the ones you know, like Card and Bear and Gibson. They're all worth going out again. And I certainly find whenever I pick up their books and read them again, I get great enjoyment and possibly greater enjoyment out of them. Because, you know, with the, the distance of time, you realise that it was exciting then. They're still exciting now. This is Outlaw Bookseller. Hope you enjoyed that. Watch the link videos. Um, like, subscribe, comment, all that super thanks. Thanks to all the regular viewers. And I'll see you again soon. Bye for now.